Love You a Brunch, a foodie podcast for those who'd rather be brunching. I'm Jody Stapler. Today on Love You a Brunch, we're talking to Meathead Goldwyn, founder of AmazingRibs.com, author of Meathead, The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling, and self-proclaimed barbecue whisperer, hedonism evangelist, and culinary mythbuster. He sits down with me and teaches me so much on how to cook a great piece of meat, from beef to pork to chicken to seafood. So sit down and join us on Love You a Brunch. So I'm really excited to be talking to Meathead Goldwyn today. Um, I hope that's not the name your parents gave you. <laughs> Actually, my father started calling me Meathead during the Archie Bunker years. So oh my god! I, I guess I guess he did. <laughs> he did. Then there you go. Well, it's a great name, and especially since you do everything with meat, really. Um, you've been told you've been called the Barbecue Whisperer. Hedonism evangelist and <laughs> culinary mythbuster. <laughs> so tell me how you got started uh, with your website, with your book, things like that. Well, I've been in and around food all my life. Dad was a food food scientist uh, and uh, had a butcher shop at one time. I used to hang out by the grill with him and thought that was really cool stuff. I loved my favorite dish was his beef ribs. Um, I... Uh, Worked in restaurants all through high school and college. Dad actually owned a restaurant for a while. Mom and Dad uh, ran it. And, uh, uh, you know, I just fell in love with barbecue when I was in college in the South and uh, worked for the Chicago Tribune and the Washington Post for years as a wine and food writer, wine critic for the Washington Post for three years and uh, ran a magazine about wine. Uh, wine, beer, and spirits, actually. And uh, so I had spent my life. Uh, bar- the website, uh, AmazingRibs.com, started as just a hobby in 2005 and became a full-time job in five years. Wow. Well, it's a great website. It has a lot of information. I was checking it out um, quite a bit. That I don't know if you've heard uh, my show before, but I was vegetarian for 16 and a half years, most of my adult life. So just coming back to eating meat when I got pregnant with my daughter seven years ago, I still don't know how to cook meat. I have to <laughs> Google it, and I have to follow directions. And so I, your book is like the Bible to me. Oh, like I'm it's, flattered you it's think so. great. It's an excellent book, 203 pages, I believe, of the actual how-tos. I mean, it's like it's cooking meat for dummies, really. Uh, well, you know, there's it, a trend going on now. Um, just uh, last week, um, Kenji Lopez-Alt won Cookbook of the Year um, for his book, The Food Lab. Uh, um, uh, we've seen Cooks Illustrated really gaining in popularity because they emphasize um, technique and concepts and food science. Uh, we've seen uh, Alton Brown's show... Uh, with his emphasize, emphasis on science. And I bring some of the same thing to uh, barbecue and grilling. Although one of my favorite recipes in there is the eggplant parmesan, which is meatless. Um, right. On the grill, it's just wonderful. And yes, by the way, I was aware of your your, your vegetarian past. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, it's, it's funny because now I don't think I can get enough meat. <laughs> We try we try to kind of calm it down, but, you know, we figure 16 years we didn't have any meat. Surely we can do it now. So we're kind of taking the other extent. You know, um, <laughs> you, you know the, I don't want to get into the, the very contentious discussion about um, uh, the, uh, the healthiness or the morality of eating meat. Um, there's arguments on all sides, and they're all intelligent. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the lessons that we've learned and what, what science has taught us, research has teach, is, continues to teach us, is that everything in moderation. Uh, right. I, I did the math once because somebody was uh, talking to me about the dangers of bacon. And uh, uh, I calculated that if you live, uh, I think it's 73 is current uh, estimated average age. Uh, Sounds about right. You eat 87,000 meals in your lifetime. You can have wow. a little bacon every now and then. Probably not every morning. 
You can even eat Cheetos every now and then. You can right. eat junk food occasionally. You just don't want to do too much meat. You don't want to do too many vegetables. I mean, there's a problem with it overdosing on anything. You can drown in water. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. so probably the gallon and a half of ice cream I ate yesterday probably oh. was not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> You're not pregnant again, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You know, just one of those down days. <laughs> oh, but no, you know, I grew up with a mother who didn't cook meat very well. Um, you know, she, she, in her own mind, she, it, she was a great cook, but I didn't like the way she cooked. In fact, her meat always, to me, was like chewing shoe leather. Mm. So, you know, growing up, meat was not something I looked forward to. Now, as I'm older and I'm, you know, going to restaurants on my own and things like that, you know, when you have a really good cooked piece of meat, I mean, it's so delicious. And that's what I'm trying to do at home, and I'm still having problems Can with I that. Can I give you so, the secret, the single most important secret? Sure. A good digital thermometer. Meat is at its most tender and juicy when it hits a number that we have figured out through practice. For example, beef. Steak is most tender, most juicy. Now, there are machines that actually can measure, called a Warner Bratzler machine. It's like an artificial tooth, and it tries to penetrate, and it can measure how resistant the meat is. We know that the best all-round texture, taste, juiciness for a steak is 130 degrees, approximately, give or take, 5 degrees, which is medium rare. It's okay. reddish, not purple. Purple is, 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 is rare. Um, it, it's not pink, which is medium. It's in that reddish color range. And 130 degrees is at its optimum. And if you have a good instant read digital thermometer, and you can buy nice ones, there's a brand called the Thermopop. Uh, it's about 30 bucks. I've seen it go on sale for 20. It reads the temperature precisely within five, to, uh, five seconds. Um, the old dial thermometers are not very accurate. That's a hundred year old technology and they take 30 seconds or longer to read. Uh, a, a rapid read digital thermometer will drastically improve your cooking overnight, indoors or out. Okay. So 135. 130 to 135 for 130 medium rare. I've got a meat temperature guide um, that uh, we published uh, that's, a, that's for free on the website. You can print it out. Uh, go to the table of contents and look up the meat temperature guide. Of course, it's in the book. Um, there's a magnet version on sale at Amazon. for. There's actually a short version for five or six bucks and a long version for 995. that has got all the temperatures for... Beef, pork, shrimp, um, and it also lists the USDA safe temperatures. That coupled with a thirty dollar thermometer, and you, it's just you just can't miss. It's just like yeah. um, uh, hitting the bullseye every time. Right now, what I did find interesting while reading your book was that you say, "Don't worry about the juices being blood," because you know, uh, in in yeah. my mind, you look at it and you think, "Oh, I don't I don't want to eat blood." Yeah. But you're saying that's not what that is. Yeah. In a steak, for example, or even chicken, when you cut into it, you see juices coming out. They're often pink. Those pink juices are not blood. Think about blood for a moment. When you cut yourself, it's very, very dark red. It's almost black. And it starts to coagulate the moment it hits oxygen. Um, when you cut into a steak, the juices are runny. They're thin. They're pink. Right. Blood has been removed uh, in the, in the uh, slaughterhouse. Um, those pink juices are mostly water. The pink comes from a protein called myoglobin, and that's what gives meat its ready, its ruddy, ruddy or reddish color. And uh, so it's a, it's it's a small amounts of myoglobin dissolved in water. It's mostly water, and that's why it stays thin and and pink. Otherwise, it would coagulate. Yeah, that makes sense. That does. Now uh, that totally changes things for me because sometimes, you know, like I said, I'm not very good at cooking meat. So when I try at home, I always try for like a medium well just because I don't want that blood. Yeah. But if it's not blood, I can go a little bit less. Yeah, and, you know, I, I, I jokingly say every time we call it blood, somewhere in Indiana, a teenager becomes a vegan. 
Uh, it, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> it's, 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 it's mostly water. It, call it juice, if you will, because it yeah. is juiciness, and it makes the meat more palatable. Um, if you cook the meat further, it actually fixes the myoglobin into the meat. It turns gray. It locks in the color of the meat as a dark color. The meat's drier, and when meat is drier, it absorbs more saliva from your mouth. Saliva is a lubricant, and so you have a much less pleasant dining experience. Juicier meat, it makes it easier to chew, easier, easier to swallow, easier to digest, and more flavorful. Yeah. Now, okay, so is there a difference when you're buying your meat um, at the grocery store as opposed to, like, um, every so often my husband and I will go to a local farm and we'll buy, like, half a cow, and it's grass-fed meat. And to me, it tastes a little bit different. You know. And it's a little harder to cook. You know, grass-fed is really interesting. Um, I'm uh, I'm an old codger. I'll be 67 next month. Um, I recent not recently, but a few years ago, I had my first grass-fed steaks, and it was just this weird flashback to when I was a kid, because mm. all steak was grass-fed when I was a boy getting, you know, and Dad was grilling out back. And it's only been in the last 30 years or so that cattle have been corn finished or grain finished um, in the uh, in the large feeding areas uh, before the slaughterhouse. And so the flavor of beef has changed over the years. And now there's a movement to going back towards the proper term. I think is grass finished. Um, okay. Uh, gra- most most cattle are grass fed through most of their life, but it's when they're sent to the um, large pens, the uh, concentrated feeding areas, where they're all together just prior to slaughter, that they switch them from grass to grain, um, mostly corn, or some soy, other grains. But with those grains, you get. Um, more fat in the meat. Fat is flavor. Fat is tenderness. Fat is juiciness. And so you get a different flavor when it, they're grass fit. That, 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 that's called the finishing process. When you when they're grass finished, that is, they're eating grass through their entire life. They have a slightly different flavor, a slightly different texture. There's less fat in the meat, um, and uh, so it has a, a slightly different texture as well. Um, and it's and it's an acquired taste. Uh, people who've been raised uh, on grain finished are not sure they like grass finished. And it's it's going to be interesting to see. It's a distinctive characteristic. I like both, but um, you do pay more for grass fed or grass finished uh, meat yeah. nowadays. Right. Right. Well, you know, and you, we think, you know, you get in your mind, you know, that's probably healthier. We're eating meat now. We, maybe we should go healthier. But it really it's more difficult for me to cook. Yeah. I guess because that fat's not there. You know, again, it's a question of healthier. Um, There's some evidence that there's more omega B3s. Now, I'm really uncomfortable talking about health. I know a lot about food science, and I know a lot about um, food safety. But this question of what is healthy and what is not is a moving target, as you well know. When When I was a boy, um, we were all told, don't eat butter, switch to margarine. And, of course, mm-hmm. now we're all told, well, that's trans fat, go back to butter. Um, right. We were, you know, we've been told of the dangers of uh, alcohol, but wait a minute, uh, small amounts of alcohol are good for you. It's a, the problem with what's healthy and what's not is that most of what we know or we think we know about what's healthy or not comes from epidemiological surveys. That's a 50-cent word for meaning they ask people to fill out a diary or what they eat, and then they try to draw correlations between what they've been eating, you know, heavy meat eaters versus non-meat eaters, how many incidences of cancer in one versus the other, and they try to draw conclusions. But I think scientists know very well that correlation is not causation. And that means, well, here's my favorite example. Um, We know that if you watch a lot of TV, people who watch a lot of TV have a higher incidence of obesity. So, therefore, we must conclude that watching television, the TV must put out some sort of radiation that makes us fat. Fair (laughs) conclusion? Sure. Of course. Correlation, uh, causation. 
So, you know, it's very hard to draw these causes and effects. Again, 87,000 meals, how often are you eating beef? Right. Once a week? Twice a week? Um, how much health benefit are you going to get from a grass-fed cow versus a corn-finished cow? I don't know. Um, how much risk is there in uh, a, a couple of strips of bacon once or twice a week? Uh, you know, it's very, very hard to measure this, and uh, anything that they've said so far is not definitive. Yeah. This is how I think about it. I've seen that show where people have weird addictions and people are living and they're eating things like dirt and chalk and aluminum foil. Surely having meat every so often yeah. isn't that bad. Yeah. Now look, you know, keeping it into perspective again, um, the most dangerous thing we do in life is getting behind the wheel of our car. Mm. Um, that is, uh, I mean, something like 30,000 people a year die behind the wheel of our car. 3,000 people died on September 11th, 2001. Yet we have completely turned the society upside down to protect us against uh, terrorism. Um, I don't see people uh, running uh, for president right now screaming about automobile safety. Right. Um, so, you know, let's keep things in perspective. Yep, exactly. So let's get back to your book. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so honestly, this is the book that all dads are going to want, or all people who are out there on the grill, for sure. Um, my neighbor, for instance, is a, he got a big smoker last year, uh, so he's always into trying to smoke his meats, and we, he had a competition with his, like, family to try to uh, figure out who cooked their meats the best. <laughs> and I, I told him, this is the book that you want. Um, you have, it's every little information. I mean, down to what kind of grills to get, how to cook it on this kind of grill as opposed to this kind of grill. I mean, it really is like the science of great barbecue. Well, thank you. Uh, about half the book is devoted to concepts, technique, um, science, uh, myth busting. Um, I call them old husband's tales. You know, you mentioned uh, every guy in the back, and you almost bit your tongue there. I uh, did. <laughs> because it is interesting. It does seem, you know, I haven't quite got the hand. Why, it, why don't you grill more often? Well, you know, I, I can't say that because I actually do. I, I'm the main chef in our house, and I really enjoy cooking outside more than I do inside. But Generally speaking, when I go to someone's house, it's always the dad. Like my father-in-law is the one that does the cooking outside. Or like I said, my neighbor, he's the one that does the grilling outside. It's a little odd in my house because I'm the one who does it. But most people I know, it's the man. Yeah, I, I have a theory about it. Um, and I don't know if it's true or not. You tell me from your gender perspective. I, I okay. think I think women want to let guys have their space. This is okay. He can go outside and cook. I, I just assume he's out there. He's not messing up my kitchen. And yeah. let him have his little space. Let him think he's a chef. And let's humor him. And we'll just cede that territory to him. Right. It's, I, th I think that's true. And I also think maybe it's because the woman – you know, most of the time we're the ones that are cooking the meals the rest of the week. So when he's out there and cooking the meal, it's kind of like, oh, we're going to be served today instead of having to be yeah, the one to do yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, uh, but of course, you did all the prep. You did the marinade. Yeah. <laughs> you did the salting. True. You did the trimming of the meat. You prepare yeah. all the side dishes. You set the table. You pick the <laughs> wine, and he comes in and gets all the glory. Yeah. That's how exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I, you yeah. know, I like to cook veggies on the grill. I mean, it's springtime right now. Nothing is easier than um, uh, asparagus on the grill. It mm. gets really crispy. Um, I like to toss it with a little oil uh, just to get it uh, uh, so it conducts heat a little better. And uh, a sprinkle of salt, bring it in. Maybe shave some Parmesan and drizzle a little balsamic. Wow, boy, that's great stuff. And I grill it till just, you know, get some brown marks on it. Uh, uh, you can do uh, p baked potatoes on the grill easily. Um, you can throw wood chips on the grill and get a little smoke flavor, and that's a wonderful spice that you can't find on your spice rack. Um, there's a great deal of new flavors that you can generate outdoors you can't generate indoors. That's true. 
Now, um, when you say baked potatoes, now do you recommend like putting it in a foil like my mom used to do when we went camping and things like that? Well, when you do that, you're just steaming it because you're not exposing it to flame. You're not exposing it to smoke. It's all in a little capsule there. So it really doesn't make any difference whether you do that indoors or outdoors. Um, and, of course, some of the fun of the baked potato, especially if it's a good potato, you know, a, a good uh, russet. Uh, I love eating the skin, uh, mm-hmm. especially if you can get it a little crispy. Uh, so I like to um, I like to put it on the grill. One of the things we teach in the book, and that I think is a really core concept in a successful outdoor grilling, is to learn how to use a two-zone setup. To take your, your grill, whether it's a charcoal grill or a gas grill, and make one side of it really, really hot, and the other side not. And you have direct heat on one side, and no direct heat on the other side. So if it was a gas grill, you turn the burners on one side on high and leave the burners on the other side off. If you have charcoal, you push the charcoal off to one side. So when you cook on on the side with the direct heat, you have radiant heat. It's direct flame radiant heat. It's very hot. It transmits energy really fast. On the other side, you have convection heat. And it's just like being in an oven. The air flows around the uh, the food, whether it's meat, potatoes, or whatever. And it warms it gently, but you can't burn it on the indirect side because it's indirect heat. There's no direct flame. So right. you can't get in trouble. And that's a really great way to do baked potato or chicken in particular, which has a tendency to flare up because of the skin, which is fatty. Mm-hmm. Um, you start on the indirect side, warm things up and then move it over to the direct side at the end of the cook, not the beginning of the cook, at the end of the cook, and you sear it at the end, or you get this crust on the potatoes uh, crispy. And what I like to do with the potato is I like to, I, I, I take it, okay, here, here's my potato technique. I'll okay. Take, I'll take a, 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 a big baking potato, and I'll slice it in half lengthwise, and I'll actually get it a little wet. Um, I'll sprinkle it with salt. When the, sur- when the surface is wet, the salt dissolves, and it migrates into the potato. Salt mm. penetrates meat, vegetables very well. Other spices and herbs are too large. They won't penetrate. They sit on the surface. It's a common misconception. Marinades barely get more than an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch from the surface. The molecules are too large. Salt, however, goes deep down into just about everything. So I, I wet the potato, salt it, then I season it. The seasoning stays on the uh, surface. I use a spice rub, and, and I put it on the indirect side of the um, uh, of the grill, warm it up uh, to about uh, 190 degrees. Again, using a digital thermometer, check the temperature. When it's about 190, 200 degrees, move it over to the hot side and stand there with the lid up now, and watch it so it doesn't burn, and get that skin crispy, and get the cut side golden brown, just like a French fry. And, uh, and and if you want, you can actually put a little oil on that side to help kind of sort of fry it a little bit. And uh, then you've got yourself one heck of a good baked potato, and you actually cook that all the way up to 210, 212 degrees, right to the boiling point to get it fluffy and uh, and and delicate yet crispy on the outside. Oh, that sounds awesome! I I'm, I swear I'm going to be using this book all summer. <laughs> if, I really am. If I wasn't a meat eater, I'd be potato head. I love my potatoes. I am a me carb too. addict. <laughs> yeah, me too. Now you also mentioned not, um, that it's okay to flip things more than once. Yeah, that's another interesting um, uh, old husband's tale. Um, uh, they tell you just put the meat down and don't turn it and um, um, there's really good experimental evidence and also theoretic science uh, that, that explains. Um, again, I like the, I like the two-zone setup for almost everything. Uh, let's take a steak, for example. You can, especially if you've got a thick steak. Now, you cook thick steaks differently than thin steaks. Um, uh, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm rambling here, but um, thickness is the really important key to understand in cooking times, whether you're indoors or outdoors, whatever you're cooking, it's the thickness of the food you're cooking that determines how long it cooks. Any cookbook that tells you put the meat on the grill for three minutes, then flip it, then bring it in is insane because 
a thicker piece of meat is going to take longer to cook than a thinner piece of meat because the heat has to travel from the outside to the center. And the outside of the meat is cooked by the hot air, but the inside of the meat is cooked by the outside of the meat. In other words, the hot air is not penetrating the meat. The hot air is just heating the outside of the meat, and since meat is 70% water, that water heats up and transmits the heat deep into the center. So the air cooks the outside, the outside cooks the inside. And so you start it on the indirect side of the grill where it's going to warm gently, and then towards the end, you move it over to the hot side, just like we were talking about with the potatoes, lift the lid so you can watch it, and flip, 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 so that you're getting heat concentrated from the radiance of the of the hot flame right below it on the surface and then you flip it and that surface cools and it allows the heat to come off the top rather than go deep into the center of the meat so you have this way you get um, a, a steak that's the same color from edge to edge typically if you just put it over hot charcoal and cook it all the way you get a dark exterior, which you want. That's crunchy Maillard chemical reactions that create wonderful flavor. But underneath that dark exterior, you have a layer of brown. Then you have a layer of tan. Then you have a layer of pink. And finally, in the center, you have a little thin strip of perfectly cut, cooked medium rare meat. If you do it indirect first and then move it over to the hot side, you'll get all of it, edge to edge, the same color, the same um, juiciness. It's a much better technique. Yeah. Now, is there a, a specific uh, type of, like, Delmonico, filet, or whatever that you recommend for the summer barbecues? Is there one that's better than the rest? I have a preference. Um, I, I think that, you know, again, um, the uh, science has shown that some cuts are more tender than other cuts. Um, the 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 um, the rib section um, from just past the shoulder to almost to the hips uh, is a is a uh, long slender muscle called the uh, longissimus dorsi, and that muscle doesn't get a lot of work, and it does have a lot of marbling. It's a lot of flavor, and that's the muscle that makes up the New York strip, and okay. also the ribeye. Okay. And underneath it lies another muscle um, uh, that we call the tenderloin, and that's the most tender of them all. Um, but it doesn't have the same marbling, and mar fat does carry flavor. Uh, so I tend to lean towards strip or ribeye as my favorites because they balance tenderness and flavor, uh, uh, although there's a lot of other great cuts there. For an inexpensive cut, I love a flank steak. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a chewy cut. It's a tough cut. But if you know how to cook it, you can make it really tasty. Uh, there's uh, the, the flat iron steak, which comes from in the chuck, in the shoulder, is another really tender muscle. Uh, so there's a lot of fun stuff. That once you, it's, it's worthwhile learning a little bit about the different cuts because you can occasionally find bargains. Ribeyes tend to be expensive. Filet right. mignon, which comes from the tenderloin, tends to be expensive. Yeah. No, yeah, well, that's why my husband goes shopping on Sundays to beat out the senior citizens that are fighting for the discounts on meat. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, but you don't just have beef in there, so let's make sure everybody knows that. You have everything. You have, um, of course, pork, um, chicken, um vegetables and sides and you have desserts inside as well and then of course seafood like that's the new one to me seafood grilling now last year i did try i'm a fisher i like to fish so i caught a huge trout last year and i i did do that on the grill and i i saw the one that you had the recipe you have in your book i'm going to try that we're, we're actually going fishing this weekend so hopefully i'll catch a trout i'm going to try that but what's the best way to do that is it on um, like there's a, a, like a marble or a stone board thing that you stick your fish on and stick it in the grill, or do you just put it right on? Um, well, you face the same problem with almost all fish. Fish are really high in water content, more than steak. Ste steak, pork, chicken, they're all around 70% moisture. 
fish can run 80, 85 percent moisture, um, and uh, they they do stick. Um, that's the first problem with fish is is fighting the sticking. Uh, the best way to fight sticking uh, is to oil the fish. Uh, okay. Get a layer of oil on it, and one of the best ways to get a layer of oil on it is with mayonnaise. Mayonnaise, actually, it has uh, uh, both oil, it's mostly oil, but it has egg protein in it, and it really helps combat sticking. And it doesn't add a huge amount of flavor, a little bit. So you might consider mayonnaise on it. Fish cooks fairly quickly. Again, there's no substitute for a digital thermometer. Fish is, one, is relatively unforgiving. It can, particularly tuna. Now, you're not going to catch a tuna. No. <laughs> but um, it, some fish can go from tender and juicy to cardboard you know, in, in, in just a couple of minutes. Again, a, an instant read digital thermometer. I have an electrical engineer that we pay to test thermometers. We have a database of thermometers. Um, uh, go to our database on AmazingRibs.com and look at our thermometer database. We give gold, silver, bronze medals. Order one online. This Thermopop that I mentioned is a real favorite of mine for about 30 bucks. I think it's the best, modest plot price. Top of the line is one called Thermopen. That's the one that all the chefs use on TV. It's about 100 bucks. Uh, but uh, a good thermometer, and you want to cook your fish to no more than 135 degrees in the in the thickest part. Okay. And uh, fish, because it tends to cook quickly, you you probably cook it over uh, the the direct heat. You can either fillet it or you can cook it whole. Trout often is cooked whole, and I like to put some herbs and maybe some citrus in the cavity. And one of the cool things that you can get for trout, because it it will stick if you're not careful, is it looks like um, it, it's called a fish basket, or it it looks like two tennis rackets hinged at the top. Yeah. And what you do is you you open that up, you oil the the the, uh, the interior of the basket, uh, you oil the surface of the fish or mayonnaise it, stuff the fish cavity with some herbs, whatever you got fresh or it's in the garden or even dried herbs. Uh, throw some uh, orange slices or lemon slices, clamp this basket closed, put it over the heat, um, close the lid, and just keep an eye on it, flip it, um, watch the temperature, and uh, it's, you know, fish, m most foods, most foods, you just want to get out of the way. You don't want to yeah. over-season, you don't want to over-flavor. People tell me that they inject their Thanksgiving turkey with, Garlic and Dr Pepper or ginger <laughs> ale or stuff, and yeah, I, yeah, you know, I can get a can of Dr Pepper for a buck. I don't need to make my turkey taste like that. Right. Fish, in particular, has such a delicate, elegant flavor. Just the secret is don't overcook it, and enjoy the natural flavor. A little salt. Salt is an amplifier. It does turn up the volume. Uh, salt is a, is an important uh, device. You don't need a lot of herbs and spices to make things taste great. Just don't overcook, and you have great eating ahead. Okay. And now um, I notice you have the beer beer can chicken that every that <laughs> seemed to be the trend for a couple years. And you're saying, you know, don't don't do it. Don't. It's a waste of your beer. It's a waste <laughs> of good beer. I'd rather drink it. Well, when you think about it. Now, the way beer can chicken works, you get a chicken, you know, you get a roaster, it's three and a half pounds, and you you stick this metal object up its butt, okay, <laughs> and it's got beer in it. And the theory is, is and it stands up, it looks kind of like this little mannequin yeah. standing up, it looks very cool. Um, and the theory is, is the beer is going to boil and steam and the steam is going to penetrate the meat, and you're going to have this wonderfully moist, flavorful chicken. And it's just crazy. It doesn't happen that way. First of all, mm. the beer cannot get through the metal sides of the can. The can <laughs> is up the butt of the chicken, and it fills up the cavity. So if it could boil, it would come out of the top of the can, and there's only a small amount of the chicken above the can, and that's in the shoulder area. And right. the beer is 95% water. There's 
almost no flavor compounds in beer. If you want flavor, you go to your spice rack. There's almost no flavor in it beer. So any moisture that would that would condense on the shoulders of the meat is not going to have much flavor at all. And it doesn't penetrate. Again, we're dealing with molecules that are huge. They cannot get into the meat. They're going to settle on the surface. But the big thing is, is that your chicken comes out of the refrigerator at 38 degrees. It's done when it's 160 or 165 degrees. Beer doesn't boil at 160 to 160. It doesn't boil until 212. Now, it starts steaming at around 190. But yeah. if you cook your chicken to 190, you're going to break a tooth on it. Right. Uh, I mean, and we've done this. We've, we've measured the temperature. into What you're doing is you're making a beer koozie out of the chicken. You've got yeah. this nice cold beer koozie uh, <laughs> out of chicken. <laughs> Now, when you're done, it is delicious. Well, why is it delicious? Because it's a roast chicken. Exactly. And roast chicken's always delicious. But the beer can and the beer have nothing to do with why it's delicious. And there are so many better ways to cook a chicken where you right. can get flavor into the cavity rather than sticking a can up its butt. Yeah. You know, I have to tell you, well, I'm, I like, I'm a, a historical interpreter on the side every so often. I enjoy doing it. So I cook in the tavern at one of the local museums. Cool. And uh, I, you know, in the fireplace, and I, I to a chicken on the string next to the fire. And to me, that is the best t- tasting chicken I've ever yes. tasted. Because it's slow roasting, and it's, I mean, it cooks all day. It takes all day long for one chicken. Yes. But it's, I don't know, something about one it. One of the secrets to good cooking is slow cooking. That's the big... All right, we talked about gender gap here. What do yeah. guys do when they go out next to the grill? <laughs> Turn yeah. off the fire. Um, when you heat protein, it shrivels and shrinks, and it squeezes all the juices out. Um, you want to cook things gently. Uh, I try to... I teach what a cook needs to... A backyard cook needs to master... 225 degrees air temp in the indirect zone and 325 degrees air temp in the indirect zone. And that's about it. Um, you do not want to cook much hotter than that, even indoors. When you cook hot, you, you shrivel up the proteins, you shrink the proteins, you squeeze out the juices, you make the food tough. Um, that's a, a basic core concept in meat science, low and slow. And that's exactly what you're doing uh, with yeah. uh, hanging a chicken. It's 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 outside the flames, so right. it's indirect heat, and it's rotating. And this is yep. just like we talked about. When it's rotating, it's just like flipping. It's just like flipping that steak. You get what they call a sinusoidal wave. It's a sinus. You get the 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 the, the breast of the chicken is facing the fire. It's getting warm. Now it rotates away. And it's getting cool, and then it gets warm, and then it gets cool, and it's it's a wave of hot, cold, hot, cold, and that's a really good way to keep juices and flavor in, gently warming the food. Um, and you 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 know the, these old historic uh, food ways are often the best. Right, and that's what I do love that about your book. You have a whole section on campfire cooking, on how to build a fire, on how to do it the cowboy chuck wagon way. I'm all into that because, like I said, I'm, I love history. So, like, to go back and do it the way it's always been done in the past museum, always, like, or, excites me. What museum? It's a, it's a Pennsylvania German museum called Landis Valley Museum. And where is it? We're, we're in Lancaster County, uh, well, you know, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Oh, gosh. I, I I love Lancaster. I used to come down that way. I lived in Ithaca, New York for years. Oh, okay. And yeah. I would come down that way. There was a, uh, a convention I would go to down there, and I would always stop and uh, get the, um, oh, gosh, um, Lebanon bologna. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Slow smoke, uh, Lebanon yep. bologna. Um, and then the Nisley Winery. Uh, I knew the oh, Nisley family very well. My- Yes, they actually that they are right next door to my in laws, and that's where my husband and I got married. Oh my goodness! Yeah, Judith Nisley and I have enjoyed many a meal together. Oh my gosh, um, that's so awesome! And I, she has, I think, a twin sister. 
Um, and a brother, I believe. And a brother, and yeah. I've known them for maybe 40 years. I haven't seen them in a, in a coon's age. Wow. If you bump into them, give them my regards. Yeah, well, you know, I hardly see them, but like I said, my in-laws live right next door to them, so they see them all the time. I'll have to say something to them. Oh, yeah. That's beautiful country down there. And talk yeah. about talk about foodways. Of course, that's the Pennsylvania Dutch area. Yeah. That you have all the German uh, influence there. Uh, pork country, mustard. Oh, for sure. Um, that's uh, that, that's that's great eating down there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. To me, cooking in that fireplace, I, there's just something about it. And I wish everybody would at least try it once, even if they just do it at home. It just their Dutch oven, something that mm-hmm. is, they people need to do it. I did see that you said about frying chicken in your Dutch oven, and I have never done that. Well, this all right. You do like fried chicken, don't you? Oh, of course. And do you ever make fried chicken? I have, but I'm not the best at it. Yeah, you don't do it very often, do you? No. You know, and, and, and I know why. Because <laughs> it's an ugly mess. It spatters yeah. all over your stove. It fills mm-hmm. the house with smoke and sets off all the smoke alarms. That is for sure. The way to do fried chicken is on your grill. Get it out of the house. Yeah. Take it outside. I take a cast iron Dutch oven. Bring it outside, put a couple of inches of oil in there, uh, get it up to the right temperature. Um, and again, two zones, get a hot side of the grill and a not hot side of the grill. Put the cast iron uh, Dutch oven in the hot side and close the lid. When it's up to temp, you put in a few pieces of chicken. And by the way, I have tested every kind of coating known to man and without a question, the best way to make a, a, a fried chicken is to simply roll it in flour. Mm. You don't need cornflakes. You don't need breadcrumbs, panko. You don't need, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the milk, milk dips. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so you don't need a dip first. You just put it in the flour. It's moist enough. Dip it in flour, then in the hot oil, and you have to flip it. Um, and when, check the temperature. You want 160 to 165. If it's not thoroughly done, but it's golden on the outside, which is a common occurrence, you take it out of the oil and you put it on the grill, on the indirect side where it's warm from the circulating convection heat, and you close the lid and you put another batch in, and it stays over there and it finishes cooking. There's, there's a phenomenon we call carryover cooking, and people need to know about this, especially if you're working with a thermometer. Remember we said the outside of the food cooks the inside of the food. Right. Well, you've got um, a hot chicken that's coming out of 300-degree oil, and the exterior of that chicken is you know, close to 300 degrees. It's pressing heat down into the center. So even though you've taken it out of the oil or you've taken your turkey out of the oven, it continues to cook. And it continues to pass heat down to the center. So you take the turkey out at 160 degrees and you think it's going to be perfect. And in, 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 in 15 minutes, it's 170 degrees and it's overcooked. Um, mm. So you've got to kind of allow for um, carryover. Uh, if you're doing a steak, you want to take it off at maybe 128 or so. Um, the thicker it is, the more carryover. Um, okay. But uh, you got to be aware of carryover, and that's why, again, thermometers are really, really helpful. Right. Now, speaking of frying, the new trend the last, like, well, probably in the last five or six years, I think, was to have the big turkey, fr- uh, like, fryer at Thanksgiving. Yeah. I've, I've never tried it, but I always thought it would look, it looks like it would be really good. It, it, is, it, it? is good. Um, it's delicious. Um, you get really crispy skin. You get really juicy turkey, um, but I, I got to tell you, from my taste, and we've got we I didn't have the recipe for deep fried turkey in the book. There wasn't room for it, uh, but um, I prefer uh, grilled or smoked turkey. I like the flavor of smoked turkey. I think a lot of people do. That's why a lot of turkey on the deli counter is smoked turkey. Um, if you low and slow cook a turkey. Uh, you can get marvelous flavor into it, and you can still get crispy skin. And I think it's a bit – I prefer it that way. I do my turkey that way every year. 
the deep frying is cool, and it certainly is a sight to see, but there's <laughs> some real serious hazards to it, and you don't just go out and get a big pot and right. pour a bunch of oil on it and throw the turkey in there. Cold turkey in hot oil is going to create a huge boiling cauldron. It will right. easily boil over. You have to have a pot much bigger, and you have to allow for displacement of the turkey, um, displacing the oil. It's got to be way bigger than the turkey and the oil combined so that it doesn't boil over. Otherwise, somebody's going to get scalded feet. You never wear open-toed shoes when you're frying a turkey. It must be done outdoors. Don't do it in the garage. If it boils over, it can hit the flame, and it can create a gigantic fire. You know, I've seen it burn down. Just Google. Wow. Just Google um, uh, fried turkey fires, and you'll find <laughs> pictures of garages going up in flame. Oh, my gosh. Um, it's just, and people get scalded and burned. It's just you need to know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and it has to be done very carefully. Just the process of lowering the turkey into the oil is really dangerous. Mm. Um, what I do is I take a stepladder, and I put the stepladder over the pot, and I make a pulley arrangement, and I stand way off to the side and lower the turkey in by running the, uh, the rope, uh, onto the turkey and down into the oil. I don't want to be anywhere near yeah. that hot oil. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think I'll be trying no. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what kind of grill do you have? Um, we actually have a charcoal grill. We don't have the big fancy gas grill or anything like that. Good old Weber kettle or another? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they're great. They're really great. You can do this beautifully. I actually have pictures in the book and on the website of how I do my turkey. I like to take the backbone out and flatten it out, butterfly it, or they call it spatchcocking. Okay. It cooks a little faster that way. When you do it Norman Rockwell style as a whole big bird, uh, it's like cooking a bowling ball, and it takes forever, and by the time the inside is cooked properly, the outside is drying out. So if you, right. if you take the backbone out and you lay it out flat, you can also get color to the inside. And we talked about the surface of a steak earlier. When you brown something, you change the molecular structure of the proteins and the sugars and the amino acids on the surface, and it creates flavor. Uh, it create. I mean, you know, what, think of a, a of a uh, roast beef. The exterior layer of that roast beef is just so flavorful. The exterior of a steak is so flavorful. A good crispy brown chicken is so flavorful on the exterior. Yeah. You want brown surfaces. If you butterfly the turkey, you can get both surfaces brown, and you get much more flavor. It cooks faster, so there is less drying out. And all you got to do on your Weber kettle is you push all the coals off to one side and get your turkey on the other side. Um, keep the temperature low, you don't, which means don't use too many coals. Use a digital thermometer, and you'll have one heck of a nice turkey for Thanksgiving. And you don't have to yeah. wait to Thanksgiving. I don't know why we only cook turkey. I here. know. Cook it this summer. Next yeah. week. Yeah, there you go. Now, do you recommend a brine like they like a couple years? Like when I started cooking turkeys, the just in the last couple years, they. Everything I read said you brine it overnight. Yeah. Brining is a very good technique. Um, it, what brining does is it gets salt. Remember, salt is an yeah. amplifier of flavor deep into the meat. And salt has another cool effect. Salt actually affects the protein a little bit so that it holds on to its moisture. So salting meat is a really good technique. Brining is a good idea, especially for foods that are lean, um, like um, uh, pork chops uh, from the loin, loin chops, uh, yeah. or turkey breast. Very lean, tends to dry out, especially if you overcook it. But there's another way to do it. One of the problems with brining a turkey is you need this huge five-gallon tub, which should be exactly should be food safe. you got to make up two gallons of brine, and all these brine recipes that you've got apple juice and sugar and spices, none of it gets into the turkey. It just all sits mm. on the surface. The salt is the only thing that goes in. Okay. So all you have to do, you can have the same impact, almost the same, um, by what we call dry brining. And I talk about this in the book and also on the website. You 
sprinkle the bird with salt the day before. The moisture in the meat dissolves the salt, and it moves towards the center. It's a, salt is magical. It splits into sodium and chloride, it gets electrical charges, and they move deep into the meat. They hold moisture. So it's, it's just like brining, only you're not sticking it in this big vat of water, and then you have to find a place to keep the vat of water. Yeah. You've got to have a spare refrigerator in the basement, or you've got to use a beer cooler and throw ice in there. And you right. just take the bird, get it out of the bag, take the backbone out, as I like to recommend, Lay it down on a uh, in a big pan and sprinkle salt on it. And uh, usually the formula is a half a teaspoon of kosher salt per pound of meat. You put more salt on the thicker parts, like the breast, less salt on the thinner parts. I use kosher salt because it's easier to sprinkle. It's a bigger grain. Uh, yeah. But you can use regular salt. Regular salt is more concentrated, so it's about two to one. Kosher okay. salt is, if if a recipe calls for... A teaspoon of salt, table salt, you use two teaspoons of kosher salt to get the same sodium concentration. Uh, but you sprinkle it on the meat, a half a teaspoon of kosher salt per pound, and leave it sit overnight, and that salt will migrate in, and you'll have almost exactly the same effect as soaking it in water. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great technique, and I highly recommend it. Yeah. Now, you have like a whole section on brines and marinades and sauces and things like that. So it, that is a great section as well. Yeah, we talk a lot about the science of uh, uh, of brines and marinades. Uh, again, marinades, a, a lot of people think that they go deep into the meat. Um, it, it's easy to prove. It doesn't. It just sits on the surface. It's a surface treatment. If you take something like a pork loin and marinate it for overnight, um, if you cut it open and look in the center, there's no marinade down in the center. Uh, you can cook it up and you'll taste it and it'll taste like it's gotten marinade down in there, but that's because it's on the surface and then it gets on your tongue and your tongue is fooling you. There's no yeah. marinade down in the center. It just doesn't go more than a sixteenth or an eighteenth of an inch or an eighth of an inch past the surface. Yeah. Okay. Now also you have a section on ground meats. So if people, you know, oh, I don't usually cook any, like, steak or anything. We just do hamburgers and hot dogs. This is in here, too. Yeah. And ground meats, boy, it sounds like I'm a thermometer salesman. Uh, <laughs> ground meats, now we're, now we're talking, ground meats and poultry, um, they are two of the most risky foods on the market. We'll talk about ground meat first, since you asked. Um, let, when, when meat is slaughtered um, and the animal is butchered, um, there is contamination on the skin of the animal. The animal has been living uh, in a herd with a bunch of other animals. They're pooping on the ground, and that stuff has E. coli, uh, pathogenic E. coli and other things in it, and it can get on the skin of the animal. When the butcher slices it open, it can get on the knife, and it can get on the meat. If they're not careful and they slice open the intestines, the intestines can spill out and get on the surface of the meat. Usually there's very little exterior contamination. Modern slaughterhouses are fairly clean. Uh, the meat comes to the grocery fairly clean. But there can be some contamination on the surface. If there is, the minute you throw it on the hot flames, it dies. It kills. It doesn't survive. It will flavor it any. Don't worry about eating poop or anything like that. <laughs> it won't flavor it any. Um, almost all pathogens die at about 160 to 165 degrees almost instantly. With, okay. Within seven seconds at 165 degrees. So the minute you throw it in a hot grill or on a hot oven, you're, you're safe. The problem is, is if you grind it up. If there's contamination on the surface and you grind it up, now the contamination is evenly distributed throughout the meat. And so you make a hamburger patty, and if you don't cook it, USDA recommends 155. And I'm not going to argue with them on that. My loved ones are too precious to me. Right. Um, if you cook it to less than 155, 
there's a chance that the bacteria will survive and somebody could get a tummy ache and get sick. Now, you may say, well, I know my butcher and I think he's clean and I think it's safe, but you don't know for sure that they cleaned the grinder properly before they made the meat. You don't know for sure that when the shipment came to the back of the warehouse, it didn't sit on the loading dock and then microbes can double and triple in 20 minutes. You don't know anything about the whole food chain. Cooking is the kill step. Cooking kills dangerous pathogens instantly. Um, cooking is the safe. Anything raw, anything raw is dangerous or potentially mm -hmm. risky. You know what? The, I, I happen to be married to a high-ranking FDA food safety scientist. Mm -hmm. You know what the riskiest food in the grocery store is? Well, since we're talking about ground meat, I'm going to say ground meat. Nope. No. I don't know. Sprouts. Really? Yep. Raw sprouts. Yeah. Well, think about it. You get a handful of seeds. Now, these seeds have been growing on bushes out in an open field where birds fly by and Mickey Mouse and Bambi and Thumper are wandering around. And uh, then you take a bunch of seeds. And let's say most of them are really clean, but, you know, uh, Tweety Bird did kind of poop on one of them. <laughs> and you throw it in a big burlap bag and you ship it from China to the United States or from California to Pennsylvania and uh, there's this whole bag of seeds and they're rubbing up against each other and the contamination gets all over everybody in that bag and then you take that bag and you soak it overnight in warm water. Mmm, says the mm. salmonella and he calls it yeah. warm water and they start multiplying just like the seeds do. They start growing just like the seeds. They're seeds. They like to grow right. the same way the seeds do. And so as the seed sprouts, so sprouts the pathogens. And now you've got sprouts, which are raw, often uh, heavily contaminated. Uh, wow. I, I don't know if you recall a couple of years ago, there was a terrible food outbreak in Germany where 30-some people died. It was all sprouts. Um, raw lettuce, raw spinach, raw vegetables are among the most risky um, foods uh, yeah. out there because they are not cooked. Cooking is the kill step. Now, I love sprouts, so what do you suggest? Like not to eat them, or is there a way to clean them? <sighs> I don't eat them. I used to, you don't I eat them. I love them. I used to gobble them by the handful. They're just too risky. Uh, too risky. The, wow. I, I, I am aware of committees of sprout growers that meet trying to figure out how to make them safe. They've tried everything. Chlorine. Um, radiation will kill them. Uh, a lot of people don't want radiated foods. Yeah. Uh, there's no problem with it. But, uh, no, it's just a risky food. Um, raw. Yeah. Raw. Now, cook them. Seven seconds at 165 degrees, perfectly safe. Oh, but that just takes that that fresh taste away. Yep. Oh, oh, I mean, uh, you know, I love salads. I love lettuce. I love spinach. Uh, yeah. They're not as risky as sprouts because sprouts are kept in this warm, moist environment, yeah. and that's just perfect growing conditions for pathogens. No, it makes complete sense. And I love those things. I, I I, I, there's a fa there's a fast food chain that used to serve sprouts on all their sandwiches. They don't do it anymore. Yeah. Um, it's just uh, it's the riskiest food in the store. We're worse than uh, ground beef. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's disappointing. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> I'm here to ruin your day. <laughs> well, I mean, oh. you know, you can explore this by talking to a food safety expert. Uh, Oh, I mean, it makes complete sense. I mean, it's staying in that warm, I mean, that warm, moist environment is exactly where bacteria grow. Yeah, we, so. we used to grow sprouts ourselves. We got this sprouting kit, you know, it's a little yeah. plexiglass tube, and we'd run water through it, and we'd get these fresh sprouts, and we thought we were, you know, yeah, back to earth, yeah. healthy, wholesome. Wow. I never got sick from them, but it, yeah. we're talking Yeah, but risk. there's always a chance. We're talking yeah. risk. Right. Um, there's no risk of getting um, food foodborne illness from eating Cheetos. Yeah. But there's risk in eating sprouts. <laughs> right, right. 
Now, talking about back to the burgers, now, so you're saying, like, it should should they be well done when you're eating ground beef? Yep. What is 155? Yep. What, what is, what's that considered? That's well done. Well, that's well done. Yep. Now, there's a way around this. What kills bacteria in seven seconds? Heat. Yeah. So you go out, and you buy yourself a chuck steak. You like about 80% lean and 20% fat, and that's what a chuck steak usually is. Okay. You take that chuck steak, and you dip it in boiling water for 20 to 30 seconds. Let's just be really safe. Seven seconds, probably. Yeah. Now you pull it out of the boiling water, pat it dry, and grind it yourself. Now you've got yourself a burger that is pasteurized. Yeah. And you can cook it to medium rare. So what about like when people go to restaurants? Do you not recommend them getting anything like a medium medium you know, well? I like I would say medium well. My husband always says medium. Yeah, I, I am. This is the curse of being married to a food safety scientist. <laughs> I bet. Um, again, it's risk. Risk yeah. is small, but the risk is higher. The, right. In other words, you, you, I mean, I I'm not a huge fan of a well done hamburger. Right, they're uh, not good. <laughs> but um, it is very low risk. Um, yeah. A medium rare burger is higher risk, and people do get sick. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of food safety blogs and newsletters that I read, and every day they come across my desk, and there's an outbreak, some restaurant, um, people got sick. Uh, yeah. And, uh, it, it, you know, you, you hope that the food supply is really clean and the food's been handled properly and it's been ground properly and it's cooked properly, but still people get sick. Um, it's not a risk with a steak because a steak is whole muscle meat and it's not ground up, but ground meat, sausages, right. um, uh, uh, burgers, um, tend to be higher risk. Um, it's you know the I, I you 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 would be best served if you really want to pursue this to get some food safety person from uh, one of the universities. Uh, Penn State has a great uh, food food science or ag department or Cornell, um, yes. uh, and talk to them about this. Uh, but they'll tell you the same thing. I just have, yeah. I, I'm well schooled in these issues because I right. I sleep next to somebody who knows yeah. this stuff. <laughs> I hear you. So hot dogs and sausages. Now, how do you now? I sometimes when you go to a store, you you can get ones that say they've already been, I guess, previously cooked. Yeah, hot so dogs are all pre-cooked. Yeah. Now sausages, though, sometimes aren't. Yes. Yeah. So how do you cook that on the grill? Do you same way, do something with it first? Same way, thermometer. Now here's okay. where most of us go wrong. Um, we we overcook our sausages. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we wait till the skin splits open and the juices come gurgling out and they get dark black on the outside. Um, it, again, a thermometer will give you off. Sausages tend to be high fat. Um, yeah. They tend to be in the 20% fat range. Um, and you need that fat for juiciness and flavor. Uh, fat is oil, lipids. They carry flavors. Um, when you get really, really lean meats, it's not as flavorful as meat that has um, fat in it. And it's because True. Um, a cow, especially a grass-fed animal, you, you spoke about grass-fed cows. Yeah. Grass-fed cows, if they feed on sage, um, which is common in Texas and in the southwest, you can taste the sage in the fat. It gets mm. into the animal, and it, it can color the fat and flavor the fat. Um, so sausages are high fat. And that's because they often have a lot of seasonings in it, a lot of flavorings in them. And they can be made from lean meats that way. So they mix the fats and the meats and the uh, seasonings. And USDA says 155 for uh, sausage. And um, uh, at 155, it's again, it's a ground meat, just like burgers. And uh, you're safer at 155. Uh, if you use a digital thermometer, uh, you got nothing to worry about. I went to... Um, uh, a football game this year, and I was delightfully shocked to see the hot dog stand. The kids making the hot dogs were tamping with a thermometer every single hot dog that came off the um, uh, the uh, grill. 
Yeah, that's great. And I just misspoke. I was just checking my numbers. Uh, USDA says 160. 160, 160 okay. Not 155 okay. for ground meats. Um, but if you'd be surprised. If you cook your sausages only to 160, it's, it's usually going to be less than what you normally do, and you'll be shocked at how juicy they are. Hmm. I'll have to try yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. You know what? I feel like I have, like, sat down and, like, taken a lesson today <laughs> because I am not kidding. I totally need this. I mean, the book, uh, it's like a, a lesson. It really is. Or, like, you're uh, getting a college class on how to do meat. And not, well, o- not only meat. You have desserts and sides in there as well. It's an awesome book. It's, it's a great book. I'm very proud of it. Uh, the, uh, the title is Meathead, named after me, The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling. Um, it comes out May 10th. It's not even on the stands yet. The website's AmazingRibs.com, and a lot of this information is also there. And uh, the, 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 key, the key pieces of information that I think we can pass along in our little chat are um, a digital thermometer makes all the difference in the world. There's no point in taking good quality, expensive food and overcooking it, ruining it, making it dry. Um, there's no sense in undercooking uh, food and risking the health and uh, well-being of your family. Use salt. It holds moisture. It magnifies flavor. Uh, the other seasonings pretty much stay on the surface. And set your grill up in two zones, a hot zone and a not-too-hot zone, and you're 90% of the way there. So make sure you go out and get this book. It's May 10th, right before Memorial Day, so great for the barbecues for that. And, of course, Mother's Day, if you have a mother that likes to do this. And, of course, Father's Day, the the coming month. So be a good gift for Dad. Uh, Yeah. uh, Yeah. Amazon is taking pre-orders. It lists for 35 bucks, and I was there the other day. And you, you know how Amazon is. They're already cutting the price. It's 23 bucks on Amazon right now. Okay, get on there and get it. Meathead, the science of great barbecue and grilling. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this so much. This was fun. I appreciate it. And I love you a brunch. Oh, thank you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Take care. I'd like to thank Meathead Goldwyn for giving me this lesson today. For more information on Meathead, go to AmazingRibs.com or visit us on loveyouabrunch.net. If you wish to purchase his cookbook, Meathead, The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling, and help support our podcast so we can keep sharing great chefs, restaurants, recipes, and much, much more with you, please go to our website, loveyourbrunch.net, and you can support us by clicking on the direct links to Amazon on our website for any of the cookbooks or items listed. If you'd like to find out more information, you can feel free to visit our website at loveyourbrunch.net. Also, thank you for tuning in to Love Your Brunch. If you enjoy listening to our podcast, please subscribe, leave us a review, and join us on our Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram at Love Your Brunch. If you have a question or comment, you can email me at jody at loveyourbrunch.net or Skype us at Love Your Brunch Podcast. Also, visit our website at loveyourbrunch.net for any information about our episodes. Join us again next week. I'm Jody Stapler, and love your brunch.